All right, everybody, this is how to DBQ sample number five. We could subtitle this fast way to a five. In the first four DBQs, we had a real solid plan how to get a six. We had a bunch of insurance. We had you know, second thesis, extra evidence, HIPAA document three times, HIPAA all seven. That's in a perfect world where time's not an issue. You're comfortable with the prompt. You're comfortable with the document. You got confidence in the topic at hand. But we all know the real world doesn't work that way. And a lot of you learned, now that you're practicing a time DBQ, it's a whole different deal. A lot of you that have been writing sixes, now that we got a timer going, you're writing twos. That's no good. We don't want twos. So what we're going to do for this podcast is we're going to have a scenario where everything's going wrong. We don't like the prompt. We don't like the document. For whatever reason, we're running out of time. We, we wasted time. We just sat there. We blanked out. This is when things go wrong. And that's what happened to a lot of you, and I totally expected it. So don't beat yourself up. Any, you do anything under pressure with a timer, something you're really good at, all of a sudden there's a timer. You're not so good anymore, right? So here's what happened. With, here's how a lot of the DBQs look. The ones you guys turned in, the way you timed yourself. Oh my God, this thing. Okay. This is what we had. I had a lot of you, some of the best um, students in the class that have really been writing a lot of sixes, handed it twos for DBQ number five. They spent all their time on thesis and contextualization, and it was good, looked good. And then they're like, oops, I'm running out of time. The rest of the essay was trash. So this is how a lot of it looked with that timer. So here's the plan if you find yourself in this situation. We're still going to take a shot at a six, but it's going to be a weak shot at a six. And there's a good chance we end up with a five. Five's not ideal. We're not saying that. But you know what? Five is better than two. So keep that in mind when you watch this podcast and this sample. Five is better than two. That's all I'm saying. You still want to get a six. But if you're having that kind of day and you're under pressure, what we don't want is to see this. Because you're only going to get two. All right. So, here's something new. For this podcast, and this for DBQ number five, we're changing up. And I'm going to put this on a Google Doc, and I'm going to have it attached to this video. So, I would advise putting this off. First thing we're going to do, okay, this is what we're pressed for time, we're stressing out. Dump an entire document. I would pick the longest document. It's going to take up the most time. Or, but sometimes a long document, if you're really solid on that particular document, like this one's World War II, a lot of people see that Hitler document, they're like, oh, I know World War II, I know about Hitler. That's something you could squeeze some evidence beyond the document out of, you might want to keep that. So either dump the longest document or dump the one that you think you know the least about. But when you dump it, dump it right away so you don't waste any time on it. We're only going to hit four documents. So our first four podcasts, we hit all seven. Because we want insurance. Hips isn't a gimme point. So we want a lot of insurance. But we can't do it in this scenario. This is a pan this is a panic situation where we're up against the timer. This is where if it's the day of the test, it just it's just not going well. We're only going to hit four. That only gives us one insurance because you need three to get the hip point. Check your college board rubric. We're only going to hit four to save time, and we're just hoping that's enough, you know. Don't take forever on a detail opening paragraph contextualization. There's a few of you where you died on the contextualization. Sorry, the PowerPoint for some reason really sucks. When I'm using screencast o I don't know why. Um, 
Now again, this is not some this is not an ideal thing to do. But if you're looking at only getting a two, then let's do this. Dump the contextualization. I hate saying that, but panic situation, you're struggling, forget about it. It's only one point. Again, five is better than two. Okay, if you're hitting if you're riding the struggle bus, you're hitting the fire alarm, five is better than two. So this is where we are for this DVQ. It's that kind of day. Try to make sure it passes the BAMS test. Check your 10-step guide. Forget about having a conclusion and a second thesis. That's step number 10 on your step-by-step -step guide, your one sheet step-by-step -step guide. Forget about that. We don't have the luxury of a second thesis and a conclusion. College Board doesn't require either one. Forget about it. Now with your DHTT, ideally, we like to have a therefore, tie it back to the thesis, argue the prompt, and try to throw a because in there somewhere. You can do all that in one or two sentences. If you're up against it, just do a therefore or a because. Sometimes a because fits better, depending how you write, depending how the prompt's worded. Give therefore a little more importance. It kind of works better, but if you can't use therefore, at least hit a because. So if we're stressed for time, the 10-step guide says for DHTT to use a therefore and a because for each document. That's, again, that's kind of a luxury. That's insurance policies. We don't have that luxury for this one. We're in panic mode. Just use one of them. You can tie back to the thesis and address the prompt at the same time if you word it right. You don't have to write a ton of sentences. To do that one sentence can tie it back to the thesis and argue the prompt. See my samples in the other four DBQs. And you'll see it in this one. Um, we talked about number seven, dumping the contextualization. As you will see in this sample essay, you don't have to have three body paragraphs. That's another ideal situation. It keeps us organized. It works with the three buckets. That's when we're just cruising right along and time's not an issue. If we don't have time for three body paragraphs, there's no rule that says we have to have them. In this sample, in panic mode, struggle bus, I'm only going to have two. If you dump that one document right away, you're, you're panicking, just use two buckets. Put three documents in each bucket. Now you only got two buckets to work with. But when you do your thesis, Still try to have a rule of three. One thing from three documents. Doesn't matter where they are. If you're struggling, just give me three things from three different documents. If you can't do that, at least give me one out of each bucket. So rule of three becomes rule of two. Right? Think Iron Maiden. Rule of two. Um, instead of using the hip sheet sentence stem, um, Emily from uh, Anti-Social Studies likes to do this. John from Marco Learning, who graded one of her DBQs, he, he gave it a thumbs up. And your AP practice book by Chris Peake, if you notice in the samples, please make sure you're reading the samples in the practice book. That's a big selling point, <clears throat> big reason why we bought these books. They don't use sentence stems. They just literally say that there's four categories, right? They literally will say the historical context for document number three is. That's fine. John from Marco Learning says that makes it super easy for the reader. Just put the intended audience of document six is. Boom. The purpose of document one is. And just say it. The point of view of Leon Trotsky, whoever is right, you know, the author of that document. The point of view of Leon Trotsky in document seven is whatever. So that saves you a lot of time too. So make sure you're aware of these 10 shortcuts because we're going to use them. Now don't make this your plan, plan A, you know, this video. This is like plan Z. This is when everything's going wrong. And the PowerPoint is just trash today. 
Okay, so let's follow our guide. Evaluate the extent to which government policies sought to affect demography in the 20th century. Okay, problem. If you don't know what demography means, we're in trouble. There's your definition. Statistical study of human populations, especially with reference to size and density. Now, one thing about this, and this is one thing that can put us in panic mode. It kind of irritated me. When I saw these documents, I'm like, Hitler? Uh, Fidel Castro? Man, I know a lot about this stuff. Well, guess what? When I saw that prompt, the majority of what I know about World War II and the Cuban Revolution of 1959 went out the window. Okay? With that prompt, me talking about Hitler getting rejected from the Vienna Art School, being blinded by mustard gas by the British in World War I, being homeless uh, in my camp, he said the only thing I was good at was giving a speech. All of that is useless to me because it has nothing to do with the prompt. So that prompt kind of threw me. We got we got to stick to the point. Okay, so underline quickly. Write yourself little notes. Know what you're going to use. USSR, the Soviet Union. There's document two. Mussolini, fascist Italy. Document three, fascist Nazi Germany. I'm, I'm sorry, 34. Hitler came to power in 33. This document's in 34. Um, keeping my eye on the prompt. How do I know what to underline? How do I know what notes to leave? Stuff that's going to help me with this prompt. Okay? Document number uh, four is Fidel Castro. Leave myself some notes. Document five. India, right? Oh, India. I can talk about Gandhi. I know a lot about Gandhi. He learned from Henry David Thoreau. Oh, guess what? A lot of that has nothing to do with the prompt. Now, what I ended up doing, this is kind of stupid. I shouldn't have done this. I dumped document seven just to show you that I'm going to dump a document. Ordinarily, if I really was in a panic situation... I wouldn't dump this one because that one document you get that's a visual, like if it's a map, if you're interpreting data from a graph such as this, that's kind of quick and easy. So it's kind of stupid of me to throw this one out. But I'm just doing this as an example. So let's just say, I don't like bar graphs, bro. So I dump it. I'm not going to deal with document seven. I'm behind on time. I'm dying. I'm having a bad day. All right. So... Document 7 would have been in bucket 3, but at this point I'm like, you know what, I'm going to dump it. So I'm only going to deal with bucket 1 and 2. So no more document 7. You know the deal with writing a thesis. Again, this comes right from your step-by-step -step guide. It should be very familiar to you at this point. I'm also, of course, I'll include it with this video. Print it off if you don't have it, please. Now here's our template. Here's a nice thing about the thesis template. All this stuff is in the ideal situation. This gives us flexibility. So we, if we are on the struggle bus, if we are in panic mode, we can work with this. We don't have to have because and approves that, maybe just one of them. We can tie back and argue the prompt and take our stand all in one sentence. If we don't have the luxury we had like in our past DBQs where we're padding it, giving it all this insurance to have a strong six, we're not doing all that. So it gives you flexibility, as you're going to see. All right, here's our prompt. Evaluate the extent to which government policy sought to affect demography in the 20th century. Specific historical evidence, such as, this is when um, you'll realize the real value of the template is when you're under stress and you're forgetting things. Uh, a couple of you said, once that timer hit, your mind just went blank. And that can happen. This is where you can really lean on the template to keep you on point. A lot of times you don't appreciate the templates until you're under a time situation. So, okay, I'm panicking, but hey, I can still copy. Specific historical evidence such as, such as Rule 3, governments banning abortions, forbidding more than one child per family, and a 50% increase of countries attempting to lower birth rates. Three different documents. Rule 3, I'm looking good. Proves that. Follow the template. Let the template do the work for me. Your, your best friend in a panic situation 
it's a guide, a map to success where you can just point, look, your mind goes blank, but you can still copy. Proves that government policies went to great extents to manage birth rates in the 20th century because, because total population has a direct impact on a country's economy, military strength, and political structure. So even though I'm panicking, I'm using this template. I still think I got a pretty good thesis here. And talking to some people on the college board, thesis is a little easier now than it has been in the past. It's not a gimme, but it's easier. So we want to, we really want to make sure we take a shot at the thesis. So I think my thesis is pretty good. Now, contextualization. This isn't as easy for me as I thought it was going to be because of the specificity of the prompt with, you know, population. So it really cut my legs out from under me. I could I could lecture about Fidel Castro and the Cuban Missile Crisis for you know ten hours, but a lot of it gets thrown out. So I'm still going to take a shot at contextualization because I got something. Seven sentences and I'm done. Now if you got nothing, don't just sit here. Some of you said that's what happened. It came time for the contextualization. You had nothing. You just sat there waiting for something to pop in your head. Forget about it. Don't do that. Think. When you're at this point in panic mode, think of this. Five is better than two, right? The Industrial Revolution began in England during the mid-18th century. I'm going back 200 years. How many times do I use the Industrial Revolution in contextualization in these DBQs? These big, these big events, each century seems to have a really big event. And, man, you can milk that cow till it dies. You know, I can use, I can use Industrial Revolution on ten different DBQs. Because I, you can relate it to so many things. It later spread throughout Europe into Russia and eventually the United States during the 19th century. So now I'm back 100 years. I'm slowly working my way up to the prompt. And some countries encouraged higher birth rates while others sought to limit birth rates to counter overpopulation. The 20th century, now I'm in the right time frame. I led up to it. Would see the implementation of extreme government policies. Why am I saying extreme? Because the prompt's asking me for the extent. Don't let that throw you off. It's asking you to what extent. You have to address extent. Of extreme government policies to address demography. Where am I getting that? Right from the prompt. Specifically, I always try to get it specifically in my contextualization. Make it easy for the reader. Right? If I'm being specific. Give me my point. Specifically, Fascist Italy, I don't think the document mentions they were a fascist, so that should get me a little juice with the reader. Fascist Italy looked to restore the Roman Empire in the 20th century, that's not in the document, and a larger population would be needed to build its army. So I'm using my, you know, my outside evidence and my contextualization, and I'm showing my reader how it's relevant to the prompt. I'm not just doing a drive-by some teacher call it a drop-off, where you just plop a random fact, and it has nothing to do with the prompt. So I'm taking it, I'm tying it back to the prompt. Other countries, such as India, look to slow down the population growth to counter poverty. This isn't the best contextualization. I'm kind of general up here, and I did this on purpose to show panic, you know, struggling, but it's still a shot. Right? It's still a shot. And I'm not dumping it. So the fact that I'm not dumping it, I think I'm on the way to still take a shot at a six, even though I'm taking all these shortcuts. It's just not going to be as strong of a shot as usual. That's where we got so far. Pause it. Check it out. Okay, now. I'm going to use my DHTT a grain of salt here. Uh, I'm going to take a lot of shortcuts. Soviet Union banned abortions and offered cash incentives for married couples to have children. My topic sentence ties back to my thesis. So whatever I used in my chicken foot, my rule of three, out of that bucket, make it my topic sentence. You don't want something in your thesis. Here's a fact in my thesis in my chicken foot. And then I never mention it again. I leave it just hanging there in a the thesis. You don't want that. So the, they really like to see your topic sentence be something that was in the thesis, right? Direct connection. 
So I'm going to hip it. The purpose of this document was to raise birth rates, therefore increasing the labor force needed for Russia's move towards industrialization. This is not in the document, so there's a little jab at outside evidence. Remember, I can't say the same thing I said in my contextualization. There's no double dipping. Any outside evidence in my contextualization, that's my shot at the contextualization point. If I get that, anything I said is now off the table. I have to have some new evidence beyond the document to get the evidence beyond the document point. No double dipping. Fascist Italy would also promote and encourage married couples having children. Describe document two. The intended audience of this document was the citizens of Italy. Notice I'm not using my hip sheet sentence stems. I ain't got time for that. I'm riding a struggle bus. I'm doing uh, what Emily at Anti-Social Studies does, our AP Practice Book does, and I'm literally spelling it out. Mussolini's point of view was that having children kept the nation strong because diminishing birth rates have served as indicators of a declining empire. So I didn't use a therefore because sounded better. If I'm not up against the time, I would have a therefore and a because for each document, but I'm dying on time. I'm going to keep moving. That's my shot. Not the best shot, but it's still a shot. Nazi Germany would start World War II in 1939, now, that alone is kind of like a drive-by or a drop-off. It's just a random fact. It's true, but it doesn't tie to the prompt. But when I say next, that ties it directly to the prompt, and I think this is my best shot at it. Based on Lebensraum, if you remember my World War II lecture, Lebensraum meant living space. This was Hitler's kind of explanation or his justification for all the horrible things he's going to do. That Germany needs living space, Lebensraum. From Hitler's point of view, having children gave married couples meaning and a sense of purpose in life, even though he didn't have children. Therefore, there's a therefore, demonstrating how individuals and the nation as a whole benefited from childbirth. So I'm keeping it in the prompt. Now, me being a big World War II guy, I've read a two-volume Hitler biography by Ian Kershaw sitting here on my bookshelf. I can't use most of it. I got to stick to the prompts. I'm talking about population. Um, I didn't use it because because I'm in a hurry. I don't have time for all that. This is, you know, the other four documents. That was when we smoke a brisket for 10 hours at 200 degrees, low and slow, wrap it up, let it rest. This one, this is McDonald's. This is a Big Mac and fries. This is quick. It's cheap, quick, taking our shot. The historical backdrop of Document 4 was, in 1959, Fidel Castro led a band of rebels, including Che Guevara. I'm just trying to show off a little bit, take another shot at every single document, into Cuba and overthrow Batista. So, sorry, this PowerPoint is just... Something is up. Okay, there's a delay. All right, there we go. That might not give me the point. I could, I could see a reader telling me that's a drive-by. It doesn't really tie to the prompt. I just took a shot. The purpose of this document was to give mothers a sense of financial security. Another purpose of this document, so I hit it twice knowing that I'm about to dump the hip. I'm only going to hit four, so I get a little insurance here, was to encourage childbirth. Communist, now, for each document, when we have time, we do a therefore and a because, we argue the prompt, tie back to the thesis. Since I kind of rushed through this, I'm going to kind of try to r put a bow on the whole paragraph. What I usually try to do for each document, because I'm dying on time, I'm just going to try to do it at the end and try to justify everything I just said and show how I'm tying it to the prompt. Communist countries like Russia and Cuba along with fascist regimes led by Hitler and Mussolini, went to great extent to promote childbirth, therefore having a significant impact on the democracy of the countries. Their countries could become stronger in the global arena because of an increased and productive population. So I'm summing up that whole paragraph. Now, I'm dumping the hip sheet. Forget it. I'm running out of time. India gave incentives that limited birth rates because India was fighting against overpopulation. I'm scribe five. I tied my topic sentence to my thesis. I'm still, I'm, so I'm good there. India had extreme policies 
Why do I use the word extreme? I want to show my reader I'm staying on point. I'm not drifting away from the prompt like a lot of people do. And I'm not forgetting about the extent, which is a very common mistake. India had extreme policies, such as withdrawing free health care benefits if couples had more than two children. I should have put a D, uh, is that D5? D5 in there. Therefore, discouraging population growth. China introduced an even more extreme, here I am using extreme, I'm trying to show my reader, I'm staying on point, I'm not drifting, I'm addressing extent. And I tie back to the prompt, and then I end with one more shot at evidence beyond the document. However, many families that had daughters now face the end of their family name being carried on. Therefore, they started leaving young baby girls to die of exposure and have another child and hope that it would be a boy because then the family name would live on. That was one more shot at evidence beyond the documents. Guess what? I'm done. That's it. I'm not doing an extra paragraph for evidence beyond the document. I ain't got time for that. Step 10, forget about it. Look, that's it. Look how short that is. And this is still, this is still a shot at six. Now, it might not be six. I might end up with a five. But five is better than two. If, if we're on the struggle bus, We'll call it a win. And if you remember um, DBQ number four, look at this. Remember this one? This was DBQ number four. Time wasn't an issue. We had 1,045 words. The one we just did we had 484 words. That's less than half. That will save you. Now, here's the good news. With less than half the words, we still took a shot at six points. It's just a really weak shot. We don't have the insurance po anywhere near the insurance policy that we had in the other one. But if we're up against it, this weak shot at a six is way better than just getting a two because we spend all our time on thesis contextualization. All right, so this podcast, this was your fire extinguisher. If there's a fire, if you're panicking, at least do this. It's a shot at a six. We'll probably get a five, but we'll still call it a win because we're going to get a little better than 50% on the multiple choice to pick up the slack here.